Well, it's great to be back. Uh, I missed you guys last week, and uh, I'm sure Pastor Rich, Pastor Greg, uh, told you guys a lot about the Shepherds Conference, and it was a great time as uh, uh, Paul and uh, Dave and Tom journeyed there with us, and we just had a great time of fellowship and and learning there, and uh, just a great time to spend together. I'll open uh, my Bible up here to the passage this morning. I tell you, it's been a great series in John. I hope you guys have been enjoying it. And uh, it's just a wonder, wonderful gospel. And so this morning, uh, once again, if you would open your Bibles to John chapter 9. And uh, we are in the middle portion of this chapter, and we're specifically looking at verses 13 through 34 today. And of course, um, Pastor Richard covered verses 1 through 12 last week, and Pastor Greg will cover the last verses, 35 through 41, and they kind of act as uh, bookends to this central section which deals with the dialogue between the man previously blind and the Pharisees uh, and the Jews, and uh, deals with uh, how the Pharisees show their unbelief in an, an attempt to discredit the divinity of Jesus, even when he's confronted by a miracle performed by him that can't be denied. And so, uh, however, attempting to discredit Jesus as the Son of God of course, we know is nothing new to the Pharisees, and proving Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is nothing uh, new to John, which we have seen many examples so far up till uh, chapter 9 here with many chapters to go. So John's purpose in presenting the evidence of Jesus' divinity in the account of the healing of the blind man is in direct contradiction is a nod to the purposes of the Jews trying to uh, prove the opposite, that he wasn't the son of God. And so John's goal is to convince his readers for all time uh, in this gospel that Jesus truly is the Messiah, the son of God, and that by, and that by believing in him uh, that you should have eternal life. On the other hand, the Pharisees' primary goal was to convince themselves that Jesus wasn't the Messiah, the Son of God, okay? And so uh, just a note before we go further, uh, the Pharisees and religious leaders who are hostile and unbelieving to Jesus uh, will either be called um, the Pharisees or the Jews hereafter in the sermon and should be understood in that context. I'm not going to try to qualify that every time. And so also note when I say the Jews in that context, I'm not referring to all of the Jewish people uh, as a whole, but to only those Jews who are in opposition to Jesus, just like I will mention when I mention the Pharisees. So I'm only referring to the Pharisees who are hostile to Jesus unless otherwise noted, okay? So once again, the subject of these verses uh, is the Jews and their unbelief against all truth and facts about Jesus' divinity. And that is what also John is trying to convey. And so the object in these verses is the man previously uh, blind in his interaction with the Pharisees and the Jews. That is what the story centers around. So in these verses, we see the Jews and the Pharisees take unbelief to new heights, or should I say new depths, uh, that we've not seen before as they repeatedly try to force the man, previously blind, to confess that Jesus was really a nobody, a common sinner, and, uh, and that he couldn't have possibly healed him. And uh, we can see here that he doesn't succumb and that he's actually excommunicated from the synagogue, which would entail... Uh, being excommunicated in a larger sense from Jewish society. And this would include excommunication from his Jewish family and friends and anyone who might be inclined to associate with him and uh, if he could get employment or anything else. Yet throughout this passage, especially the last 10 verses that we're going to be focusing on, God demonstrates through John's account 
that the man previously blind clearly sees the hypocrisy and the evil motives of the Jews through a clearer and clearer picture of the divinity of Jesus, that he is truly the Christ, the Messiah. And I hope truly this morning you see that clearer and clearer as well. And so uh, in the end, um, the man who was previously blind gives a little theological lesson of his own to the Jews, uh, proving that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So without further introduction, let's go ahead and start in verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind. So we learned from last week in verse 8 that the man previously born blind was well known by his neighbors and the people that passed by him in the, in the city there because um, they saw him every day begging for money uh, since he was born blind and unable to support himself. Even with those facts established, there was evidently some confusion if he really was born blind, okay? And you see the unbelief where it really starts, not with the, the Jews and the Pharisees, but with the people and his, and his neighbors and the people he sees every day. So some just couldn't believe that he was really the blind man they all knew all their life and that he had now received his sight. And so the man previously blind tries to establish that fact over and over and over again by saying, I am the one. What don't you get? I am the one. Uh, however, the people still did not believe uh, his account of how he received his sight, so they did what anyone back then would do. They took him to the Pharisees. Okay, if you're going to straighten anything out, you take it to the Pharisees. And so that's what they did. Because the Pharisees are the one that they thought could validate or uh, discredit his miraculous story, uh, whether it was basically true or false. And of course, a miracle by definition is something that cannot be explained by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency, you know, essentially God. And so instead of everyone rejoicing with him, uh, you have this strange reaction that they're all going to take him to the Pharisees. And, uh, and so they take him and they bring him down to the Pharisees and, uh, because they doubted his story, right? And so in my mind, uh, I can hear him saying or muttering, thanks a lot, right? I mean, that's sort of the last people you want to go down and see because uh, it's probably not going to come out good. Now, it was the Sabbath on the day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes, the fact that the man who was previously blind was healed by Jesus on the Sabbath is of particular importance to the story as we shall see in the following verses. But this wasn't the first time that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, was it? Okay, so he also healed the cripple at the pool of Bethesda back in chapter 5 on the Sabbath. And Jesus here deliberately again heals on the Sabbath and he wasn't doing that to antagonize the, the Jews or the Pharisees, but to once again demonstrate that he is, in fact, the Lord of the Sabbath. And he stated back in chapter 5, verse 17, that my father has been working until now, and I have been working, thus making himself um, e equal with God, right? That's what they were so really upset with him about. And so Jesus healed often on the Sabbath, at least for the times we have recorded in Scripture. And so uh, healing the cripple at the pool of uh, Bethesda wasn't the only time that he healed people on the Sabbath. We have lots of examples in Scripture of him doing that, do we not? And so in the other Gospels, we have Jesus healing Simon Peter's mother-in-law. That was on the Sabbath. He healed the man with a withered hand on the Sabbath. He healed a crippled woman on the Sabbath. He healed a man with dropsy on the Sabbath. And Jesus drove out an evil spirit on the Sabbath. You can read all of those in Synoptic Gospels and Mark and Luke. And so all these he did on the Sabbath, okay? So verse 15, then the Pharisees also were asking him again, uh, that is the previously blind man, how he received his sight. And he said to them, he, that is Jesus, applied clay to my eyes and I washed and I see. So not only were the neighbors and the others who knew him uh, as they walked by him asking him how he received his sight, but the Pharisees, having been drug up before them, asked him the same exact thing. And so he told the Pharisees, 
uh, the same thing that he told the others, okay? So he's having to repeat his story. I'm him. Here's my story again. How many times do I have to tell everyone? And so, uh, so he told him, the man who was called Jesus, right, uh, made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Salome and wash. So I went away and washed and I received sight. Okay, that's all I know. And so I am sure he had to repeat the story, like I said, over and over uh, for days and days on end. So this had the effect, however, right? Don't complain about it. I'm not complaining. I don't think he's complaining. But uh, this had the effect of spreading, spreading the gospel, right? The more times you have to tell your story, right? Some of you maybe when you were first saved, well, what happened to you? You're a totally different person, right? You're not going to be tired of telling people the gospel and how you were saved. And so he, this had this effect with him that he was telling people about Jesus over and over and over again. And so um, one of the key things to note in this verse is that this previously uh, blind man, that he didn't question Jesus um, what seemed, on what seemed to be an unorthodox, act without medical precedent uh, but instead believed Jesus at his word and obeyed him and went down to the pool of Siloam and washed his body and was healed and so we today in the same way should believe Jesus uh, at his word and obey him and worship him as the blind man would eventually do at the end of the chapter uh, and I kept thinking, oh, the wonderful things that God has prepared for us if we would only believe and obey and to do what he says, right, in our lives, right? Whether you're unsaved, you need to believe and obey. And when you are saved, you need to have the faith and obey and obey Christ. And what the wonderful blessings and the wonderful things that God is going to do in your life. Therefore, some of the Pharisees were saying, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others were saying, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And there was a division among them. Okay, so as I mentioned before, Jesus already had healed the cripple at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath in Jerusalem and had already dealt with the Jews there on this issue, right? He already had this dialogue directly with them. Uh, and then, then he established his authority to heal on any day of the week, being Lord of the Sabbath, right? Having come uh, from God, having, being God, associating himself uh, with God the Father as God the Son. And so the issue of Jesus healing on the Sabbath was already settled uh, since that time, uh, which just was uh, a few days before. And that according to uh, chapter 5, if you go back a little bit, verse 18, uh, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not, he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was also calling God his father, right? And so that's why they wanted to kill him. Um, and so some of the Pharisees were simply continuing down that line of, uh, and, uh, and trying to argue the fact not the fact, but trying to argue that anyone who works and breaks the Mosaic law uh, on the Sabbath, even by healing, like Jesus did, is sinning and therefore could not be from God. And their conclusion, uh, actually, as we see later as well, is that he had a demon, right? So they're trying to accuse him of having a demon, which totally didn't make any sense either, right? So people, even some of the Pharisees, are questioning that. And so the theological... Uh, problematic syllogism the Pharisees created in their own ranks was this, okay? And this is kind of the lesson today, which kind of proves that Jesus uh, is the Christ. So this is what they struggled with, and I'll, I'll try to say this succinctly, but based on Scripture and Psalms and Isaiah, they agreed, number one, that God does, does, not, hear, does not hear sinners, Okay? And we know that, and that's true. God does not hear sinners. It's in Scripture, in Psalm 66, Isaiah, first, uh, first chapter. Number two, if anyone is God-fearing and does God's will, God will hear him. Psalm 34, 15, also in Proverbs 15. And the third part, God heard Jesus and healed the blind man. Therefore, 
right? The result of that is Jesus is not a sinner because God actually heard him and healed the blind man. So this was a huge problem, a huge stumbling block for the Jews, right? So they uh, were fighting about that. So this was a huge problem for them, and they had to deal with it. And that's why it says here in verse 16 that there was a division among them. So we'll come back to that syllogism in verse 31 when the previously blind man uses it against the Jews. And so the Pharisees decided to stop arguing amongst themselves. Why are we fighting amongst themselves? Let's put this guy on the stand and let's ask him um, what he thinks. But it's not the first time that they have argued amongst themselves or the Pharisees or the Jews have argued amongst themselves. There's so many examples of them arguing amongst themselves. They just can't make up their mind as a whole, as a group, who Jesus really is. Of course, John is trying to convince us who Jesus really is, right? And so if you remember back in chapter 6, verse 52, now the Jews were arguing amongst each other at the synagogue at Capernaum concerning this statement, right, that Jesus made, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And then also in chapter 7, verse 43, previously, so the crowd gathered at the temple during the Feast of Booths and argued amongst themselves if Jesus was really a prophet or the Christ. So if you read that verse, it says, so a division occurred in the crowd because of him. So nearly everywhere Jesus went and spoke, the Gospels record that there was a great division amongst the peoples, not just in this upper class of Pharisees or ruling Jews, but just in the, uh, in the population Itself, And even if we go further in John, which we're coming up to in just a few weeks, in John chapter 10, verse 19, we're going to see a division occurred again uh, amongst the Jews because of these words. And these words that Jesus had were that he was from his Father in heaven. Okay, so there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of uh, strife going on. So they said to the blind man again, this is the um, Pharisees. What do you say about him since he opened, you, opened your eyes? And this is what he said. He said, he's a prophet. So I'm not sure why the Pharisees would ask a beggar, an outcast, someone uh, who they would consider obviously much lower, not worth asking anything of, what he thought about Jesus. Uh, because as we'll see later in verse 34, they actually do believe he was born in sins. However, the Pharisees, in fact, do ask the previously blind man who he thinks Jesus is. And just like some of the crowd at the Feast of Booths a few days later, uh, he confesses that Jesus is a prophet. Remember, some of those people uh, who were at the temple were saying he's a prophet. So he was saying the same thing. And so, um, and so this response was no more acceptable to the Jews than that certain group of Pharisees who, who, who were uh, arguing, how can a sinner perform such signs, right? So you had these Pharisees, a group of Pharisees, that were saying that, well, how can he perform such signs? And you had another group of Pharisees saying, well, he's a sinner, therefore it's not a sign or not a miracle, and he's not from God. So they both seemed to suggest that he was at least a prophet. So the Jews then did not believe it of him that he had been blind and had received sight until they called the parents of the very one who had received his sight. And so um, since the testimony of the previous, uh, previously blind man was unacceptable to the Jews, they decided that perhaps they could discredit him and therefore discredit Jesus by hook or by crook to get his parents to confess under penalty of being put out of the synagogue and losing everything that their own son was never born blind. And we know that uh, because there is plenty of pressure for them to do exactly that, as we shall see as John explains that later in verse 22. So the unbelief of the Jews was so res uh, resolute, so absolute, so unyielding that they thought nothing to discredit the innocent, formerly blind man, or to strong arm his parents with as much pressure as they could to lie about his blindness. They somehow had to bury this whole thing. And so uh, as they call his parents here, they're not calling his parents to establish the facts, are they? 
They're calling his parents to change the facts so that they could discredit the previously blind man's testimony and, of course, discredit the miracle Jesus performed as a sign from God and therefore discredit him. And uh, the Pharisees questioned them, saying, or the Jews questioned them and saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? And they asked his parents here really three questions. Is this your son? Was he really born blind? And how does he now see? And his parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. And so they answer the first two questions, right? Um, truthfully, is there was really nothing to lose by actually telling the truth and no doubt many other witnesses could attest to the same thing, that he was really born blind, and yeah, that's really their son. And so uh, his parents go on to testify in verse 21, but how he sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. And I always get a little grin when I read that there, because it's interesting to note that uh, the Jews never ask them who opened their son's eyes, right, in the text, but they're telling him we don't know who, okay? So which means they really do know who. <laughs> and uh, and uh, anyhow, this indirectly, and I'm sure unintentionally confirmed, right, with that they knew that someone, and that someone's name was Jesus that opened his eyes as their son surely told his parents, right, why wouldn't he have told his parents everything that happened to him? He was telling everyone else. And he no doubtedly said who. Um, and uh, they probably knew that before they got to see the Pharisees. So the parents practice what we call in uh, today's world good risk management. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, in the last half of this verse, and they do that by deflecting or transferring a potentially personally damaging question to their son and say, ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. I don't know if the previously blind man was present to hear and see their parents say that, but if he was in my mind, uh, he must have been thinking to himself, gee, thanks mom and dad, right? Thanks for selling me down, down river. Anyway, they tell the Jews to question their son again a second time. And so John explains why they did this in the following verses as they had a strong motivation not to answer the last half of that question. And so here in verse 22 and 23, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So John goes ahead, he explains why, right? Why they're so afraid of the Jews. And so evidently it was public knowledge that anyone who confessed Jesus to be Christ the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue since John mentions that his parents, uh, they even knew about it, right? So I just wanna stop here for a second and emphasize exactly what the consequences were of being put out of the synagogue and what that meant. Uh, maybe some of you have an idea already what that meant but uh, first to be put out of the synagogue uh, was a big deal, okay? If you were put out of the synagogue, that's, that's a huge deal. And if it wasn't, then the previously blind man's parents wouldn't have evaded the Jews' last question. And uh, the text wouldn't say, for they feared the Jews, right? So the text plainly says why they avoided answering the question, right? Because they were afraid of the Jews. They were so afraid of the Jews that they wouldn't even um, quote their son. They wouldn't even repeat what the son had told them about Jesus. And, uh, and so they don't want any part about tangling with the, with the Jews or they knew they would come out on the losing end. So I was reading about uh, what it meant to be put out of the synagogue. And so some of the very first things I read was seemed to be prolific out there uh, in the theological papers and commentaries uh, on the Greek word for being put out, was, which is uh, uh, apos synagogos, uh, 
Now, that's not really that important, but that's the word for it. So many of these writers made very light of it, like it was no big deal. And I go, I, why is that? And so I found that to be very, very troublesome. Some even said it was doubtful anyone ever got put out or that it was localized to one synagogue or that it was added later to the text or that if anyone did get put out, it was just sort of a minor infraction and you had to not show up next week at the synagogue or you know, it was like a mere slap on the wrist. And so uh, these higher, uh, higher criticism sources obviously had a very low view of biblical inerrancy and in turn, uh, I have a very low view of their theological work. But uh, uh, all these sources that I looked up, most of them uh, came from uh, Jewish sources, uh, basically trying to defend the Pharisees and the Jews, which I found very, very strange. But the contextual meaning of being put out in Jesus' time from sources I could trust, right, and uh, and finding out the context of that, is that the English word, uh, one of the English translations, depending on your Bible, is that they were excommunicated, was truly a life-devastating event that carried extreme negative consequences that I just can't overemphasize enough. So being put out, you can read it really quickly in the text, but it was a huge deal. And so here's just one source, credible source, that uh, explains uh, what it meant to be put out of the synagogue. And it's from Dr. Gary Martin, who's the pastor at Winton First Southern Baptist Church in Winton, California. And he states concerning being put out of the synagogue, he states this, to be put out of the synagogue is more than being excluded from a Jewish house of worship. It meant to be condemned by the Jews as a heretic or a pagan. It meant to be shunned by your people and banned from society Today, that that might not mean much, but in the days of Jesus, it meant everything. Being hated, excommunicated, loss of income, loss of family, open persecution, and even death, right? So the Jews put people to death. So the previously blind man's parents decided not to go that route and (laughs) not to take any chances being put out or their lives could be ruined or taken from them. So even though they knew the truth of what their son had told them, they decided to pull him in front of them to take the bullet. And they feared the Jews. I mean, they really feared the Jews and what the Jews could do to them more than loving their own son and standing for the truth. Terrible. So there are other examples in scriptures of fearing the Jews, right? Uh, There was a real thing to fear the Jews, such as later we'll read in John 12, 42, Uh, There were some of the Jews uh, that had a superficial belief in Jesus, yet because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. That's a direct reference. Yeah, putting put out of the synagogue, I ain't ain't talking. And uh, Jesus warns his disciples uh, as well um, that uh, these people, they love the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And also Jesus in uh, 1612, that we'll read later, um, of the cost, speaking of the cost of following him, says, they will make you outcast from the synagogue. You know, you know you're, you're taking up your cross in more than one way. Uh, they're going to kick you out of the synagogue, which isn't just, okay, well, I don't need to go to church there anymore. No, that means society being an outcast. Not just being an outcast of the synagogue, you're being an outcast of society. And so... Um, And so that really focused on what it really meant to be put out of the synagogue. And so today, the question to you and to me, are you willing to forsake all for the sake of Christ and to be identified with him? Or are you more afraid of men or the love of the approval of men more than you fear or love God and seek his approval? Right? Are you willing to give up livelihoods, family, and friends for the cause of Christ? What is the thing you fear the most? Being put out of the synagogue, so to speak, in this life, uh, that is losing family, friends, position, job, possessions, or being put out of heaven, not that you've already attained it yet, right? 
So I would hope it's the latter, and I pray God gives you the courage to live up to that conviction. So don't be like the previously blind man's parents. Instead, stand for Christ, stand for the truth, regardless of the circumstances, and you'll never go wrong. Live like you are looking toward an eternal reward and not the comforts and the rewards of this world. This life is a battle against sin and evil, is it not? So put on your armor. We're instructed to do that. Arm yourself with the word. So this life is but a fleeting moment. It's hard to keep that in perspective, isn't it? So fight and fight hard. Soon the victory shall be ours. We will wear the victor's crown and reign with Christ, the King of glory, for eternity. Amen? I mean, that's what we're focused on, isn't it? So don't make me break out in song and start singing, Stand Up for Jesus. I can barely preach, but I can't sing a lick. So I digress. Getting back to the text. So a second time, they called the man who had been born blind. And they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And the following exchange here in these last 10 verses is really astonishing. So um, God divinely gives him the exact thing to say at exactly the right time. I don't know if you've noticed that as you've read this. This is so that, according to verse 3 uh, from last week, the works of God might be displayed in him, right? This is the purpose, that this man was born blind. So the works of God were divinely displayed in him in, in two ways, I think. First, of course, the undeniable healing uh, as a sign that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, and secondly, by the words he spoke with supernatural courage and confidence about Christ to the Jews. Okay? He shows unbelievable presence of mind and clarity of speech in his answers. His abilities uh, to do so are far beyond natural explanation since he has been an uneducated outcast all of his life. And here he is in front of the most powerful group of men, the top religious leaders in society, and he is not intimidated at all. And he's not coerced. He's not going to be coerced. He shows no fear whatsoever. He is cool, calm, and collected. You can't help but take notice of his character and the control he has over his conduct, right? We all pray that we can live up to be people of God like that, right? And so the Jews called him back again and bullied him to basically um, repeat after me, that Jesus was a sinner and couldn't be from God. It was sort of like, make this confession, Jesus is a sinner or else, right? And no doubt he knew of the edict from, uh, from the Jews that anyone confessing or professing Christ would be put out of the synagogue. He, everyone knew that. It was a public thing. But instead of taking away Jesus' credibility as God, the very God, Having performed this miraculous sign in him, he refuses to answer them in the way that they demanded of him. And so uh, he then answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. But one thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Uh, the facts still are that he was uh, blind and now he sees. Nothing has changed since the very beginning of his interrogation and what he's been telling them. Uh, they couldn't get his parents to confess that he was blind from birth, and they couldn't get him to change his story. So the Jews at this point kept pressing him, uh, hoping that he would break and confess uh, to that Jesus was a sinner and he was not from God, but to no avail. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And so what he says next is truly perfect a perfect mixture of divine wisdom and mixed with a large dose of righteous sarcasm. And yes, that's right, righteous sarcasm. And the Apostle Paul used righteous sarcasm in many of his epistles. And I'm sure many of those come to mind to you, but we're not going to go there and go through them, right? But there is a time and place for that. And so verse 27 he answered them, I told you already that you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? I can barely say the next part of what he says. You do not want to become his disciples too, do you? 
And <laughs> anyhow, it just makes me laugh every time. Uh, so he stood there in front of the Jewish rulers, deriding them for not listening and asking the same questions over and over, expecting a different answer, right, from him. And he, at the same time, sarcastically has a question for them and asks them if they want to be Jesus' disciples too. He did this full well knowing that anyone who said that they believed in Jesus as the Christ, as the Son of God, was going to get put out of the synagogue. This showed that either uh, he, is, he has a death wish or that he has unshakable trust and faith in God, that God's going to carry him through, right? And it's something we need to meditate and think about when we have answers for people, right? Are we fearing men? Or do you really believe and have faith that God's going to carry you through by what you say? Uh, anyhow, obviously, it's the latter. But talk about undaunted, unafraid, unimpressed, courageous, uh, very confident uh, that this guy is, right? It's really unbelievable. I mean, I don't know if you can even picture the setting. Uh, oh, how that must have stung the Pharisees and the Jews uh, in their ears when he said, you do not want to be his disciple too, right? And he evidently was tired of being interrogated by the kangaroo court of the Jews and gave them a piece of his mind. And there are many, um, I was thinking there are many paintings of many significant events in the Bible, but this event is one I wouldn't mind having a copy of, especially if it included the expression on the Jews' faces when he said all of that. And what a great reminder that would be of what courage and faith look like together, something that we need to have in this day and age, of course. So of course, he undoubtedly knows he's now got it coming, right? He's got it coming. And uh, he's got to come from the Jews, but he was okay with that, you know, and you got to be okay with that sometimes. Uh, whatever authority has stepped out of line or person or whatever, and you have a response. But in a way, it seemed like he was saying, bring it. I'm ready. Go ahead. And so verse 28, they reviled him and said, you are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. Okay. And so it's one thing to give up all for Christ, an entirely different thing to take it on the head for Christ, to say nothing about those who have been martyred for Christ, right, who have stood up. And so I want to say a little bit here about the word reviled, because you just read it and run right over it and just move on here in this passage. But uh, reviled here in the Greek, which is uh, loidoro, uh, according to the Greek dictionary of the, of the new uh, Testament, it means to attack someone's character with railing, vilifying slander. So the American Dictionary of the English uh, Language by Noah Webster, 1828 edition, don't get it confused with the 1829 edition, <laughs> defines the word in terms of abuse as in rude speech, repro reproachful language addressed to a person using contemptuous, reviling words. Okay, I just want to make this as strong as I can. So they've got him there, and they're just like thrashing him. And so he was taking the severe tongue lashing from them while he was standing there. So I'm sure it was brutal, and it wasn't very fun. And they must have thought they cut him deep by accusing him of being Jesus' disciple, but in just seven verses later, he does become Jesus' disciples and worships him, right? And so as far as the Jewish leaders... Uh, being Moses' disciples, as they claimed, let's set some of the facts straight. And so we saw Jesus reprimand the Jews on their alleged claim to be the disciples of Moses back in chapter 5, verses 46 and 47. And Jesus tells them this, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And again, another example uh, that they really were not Moses' disciples is back in chapter 9 or chapter 7, verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you carries out the law? Okay, that's, that's pretty straightforward and to the point. So much for actually being true disciples of Moses, right? We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he is from. Okay, 
And so, which is another amazing statement by the Jews here. So the Jews, the Pharisees, and the Jewish crowd all knew where Jesus was from. He was from where? Nazareth, right? Of Galilee. And that was an established fact, Back, looking back at chapter 7, verse 21. The Jews here were trying to make the point that they had no information from Scripture, from God, from Jesus, or anyone else that verified where Jesus was from. And of course, uh, we're speaking of if he's of earthly origin or heavenly origin, uh, because on earthly origin, well, yeah, he was born, that's where he was born. However, every group just mentioned heard Jesus speak in the temple just a couple days before saying this, right? And this is Jesus establishing where he's from. He said, you both know me and know where I am from. And I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him and he sent me. And so they all know where he's from. You even know where he claims he's from, but they're just got blinders, not blinders, but their hands over their eyes and ears and just not accepting it, right? It's, you know, total unbelief. However, they refuse to believe he was the Christ, the Son of God, who has come down from heaven. Verse 30, the man answered and said to him, well, here's an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, right? And it's not, he's not speaking geographically, right? Uh, and yet he opened my eyes. And so the previous blind man, he's on a roll, chastising the Jews with another round of truly divine wisdom mixed with a large dose of righteous sarcasm. And he is about to take the syllogism the Pharisees were struggling and arguing and fighting about in verse 16 and use it against them. That is, whether a man can be a sinner if God listens to him and works through him to perform miraculous signs. He's basically calling them out on their own test or standard based on scripture. So he says in verse 31, we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he hears him. Now, I don't hear anyone uh, refuting that. Yeah, because the Pharisees and the Jews, they know that's true, right? He's quoting scripture, actually. And so the man previously blind really understands the scripture and the standard the Jews used, or should I say abused, to determine if Jesus was from God. And here he applies the same syllogism to prove that Jesus really was from God. And that syllogism restated is this. Uh, God does not hear sinners. If anyone is God-fearing and does God's will, God will hear him. God heard Jesus and healed him. Therefore, Jesus is not a sinner because God heard Jesus and healed him, right? I mean, that's pretty basic logic, right? And it's truth. And so um, he goes on to say in verse 32, since the beginning of time, it has never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. I tried to research that since the beginning of time. And of course, I, something I just couldn't have prepared for today, but accepting it as God's word is truth. It's true. So people could be born seeing and later become blind due to some circumstance and then regain their sight through some sort of medical healing process. People were going blind all the time back in the day. And so, uh, but people born blind stayed blind. That was something you couldn't reverse or fix. So there was no medical cure. And so the previously blind man's point was that receiving his sight had to be a miracle by which only a man from God could accomplish. Not a man of God, but a man from God could accomplish. He goes on to state that to the Jews, all of that, uh, exposing their illogical unbelief that ignored the facts of him miraculously receiving his sight. And so he goes on to say, and we're getting to the near end of this, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And so his final words here in verse 33 were a final rebuke of the Pharisees and the Jews for their unbelief. And he must have known that there was no way he was going to get out of there unscathed at that point. Okay, so be it, right, in his mind. And so he prepared himself to take whatever their unbelieving hearts could possibly uh, 
punish him with and dish out in terms of vengeance and just being cruel. And in verse 34, they answered him, you were born entirely in sins and are you teaching us? So they put him out, right? And so the Jews, depending on which pharisaical school they adhered to, believed a person born blind was bearing the consequences of basically the sin of their parents or the sin of their ancestors. They associated illness as a punishment from God for sin, much like Job's friends accused him of sin, and that's why God was bringing calamity on him. And they also believed a person could be born blind. This is sort of an interesting thing that they thought, some schools thought, that you could be born blind if it was on the account of your personal sin while in the womb, which is sort of a strange concept because some of these sects of the Pharisees pointed to Esau and Jacob fighting in the womb to see who would be born first as evidence that you could sin before you were born. Of course, Jesus had already debunked the false belief that, uh, that he was born blind because of sin right back in what we learned last week in verse 2. Uh, it was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So the Jews attempt to revile the previously blind man by accusing him of being born entirely in sins. Uh, this is what I was alluding to before, is that it unintentionally validated the fact that they actually believed that he was born blind, right, accusing him to be born entirely in sins, even though they were trying to prove that he wasn't. And you see this, this contradiction over and over, the Pharisees saying one thing and then saying something else and then going, oops, I just I kind of just validated that. So they were determined to put this guy in his place uh, after he so skillfully, completely exposed their unbelief and hypocrisy and so skillfully and completely proved Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. As a final parting blow, the Jews put him out of the synagogue, probably thinking that that would surely ruin his life and maybe cause him to think negatively of Jesus for actually giving him his sight. Who knows? But it was obvious uh, he didn't want to stay in the blind, hypocritical religious, uh, with the blind, hypocritical religious Jews. I think he made that, he knew that that game was up right from the beginning. And that's why he said what he said. So in one way, they were doing him a favor by putting him out. And so he was no doubt glad to be rid of them. And he could see clearly now, could he not? <laughs> and so I just pray today that you too can just see clearly uh, that Jesus uh, is the Christ and the Messiah and the Son of God. In conclusion, the works of God were mightily displayed in the previously blind man, as it says in verse 3, uh, because Jesus miraculously healed him. And Jesus displayed the works of God so that men may know and believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so what will you do today? Will you be like the man who received his sight and believe and obey and follow Christ and worship him? Are you willing to be put out of the synagogue of the world, so to speak, for Christ? Or will you be like the unbelieving Jews and Pharisees and be put out of heaven even before you get there? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just would pray that uh, this uh, passage of scripture as we're learning here in John, Lord, just pray they would have just a, just a huge impact on our lives, Lord, and how we live. Lord, uh, taking into account the things that we do during the day and whether we're standing for you and whether we're willing to give up all for you, even our life as a testimony uh, of you, that you truly are the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior of the world, and only through you can anyone obtain, attain eternal life. Uh, that's by regeneration in our hearts by the, by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, today as we go from here, Lord, we pray that, uh, that we would continue to study and continue to meditate and to pray over your word and to apply it to our lives, Lord, as uh, we know that you are working uh, in us and through us in the sanctification, uh, Lord, of our lives as we spend our time here as you have appointed us, Lord, as
really your slaves to do your will and to do your work here uh, during this short period of time. And uh, may we always keep our focus on you first and foremost and the fact that we have a place that you have prepared for us in heaven, Lord, and which is complete paradise, Lord. And, and uh, may we always um, stay focused on you. In Jesus' name, amen.